So the next panel that we're getting into here at 10 o'clock is a discussion about DNSSEC deployment in the root zone. The moderator for the panel will be Dwayne Wessels from Verisign, and I'll let him introduce the panelists. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, so, we, yeah, we have four, four speakers up this morning. First, uh, we're going to hear from Dave Knight from ICANN, who will uh, update us on the, the root DNSSEC deployment plan and the status of sort of where we are now. Next, Keith will represent uh, DNS OARC and ISC and uh, have some things to say about FRoot's plans and uh, what's going on with BIND. Then I'll be back up here to present some, some graphs and some, some data that we've collected uh, during the initial rollout. And uh, finally, you'll hear from Suzanne again with some, uh, some deep thoughts for the future, I guess, right? <laughs> That's a lot to ask, man. Um, so I want to, I want to encourage you, um, while, while the presentations are being get, given, uh, if you have a clarifying question or some, some kind of really short question, feel free to uh, ask us during, during that. Otherwise, um, for, the, for the more discussion-y type questions, we'll save those until the end if that's okay. Does that sound good? Are you ready, Dave? All right. Let's see if you can find your slides. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Dave Knight. Um, I work in the DNS group at ICANN. Um, this is an update to the presentation that Joe Abley gave in Dearborn. Um, with more of a focus just on this being a, a status update with some background on how we're actually going about signing the route. Um, the route signing plan is a result of a collaboration between ICANN and VeriSign with the support of the United States Department of Commerce. Um, ICANN's role there is managing the key signing key. So ICANN creates the key and maintains that and makes it available for signing zone signing keys. ICANN accepts DS records from TLD operators, uh, verifies and processes those requests, um, and passes those along to the Department of Commerce for authorization. Uh, the DOC authorizes the requests um, and then passes those to VeriSign for implementation in the root zone. VeriSign, as the managers of the root zone, they perform the actual signing. Um, to that end, they maintain the zone signing keys, which they bring to ICANN to be signed by the key signing key. Um, and they then distribute the signed zone to the root server operators. Um, this diagram shows that over on the left, um, the TLD operators send requests into ICANN, which are passed to the DOC and following authorization onto VeriSign, where they're incorporated into ultimately into the signed root zone and then on which is then distributed to the root servers. In addition to that process, below that you see the key management process. Um, on the left, ICANN managing key signing keys. On the right, I, uh, VeriSign zone signing keys, which they bring um, to be signed by the, that KSK. Um, the goal here is to sign the root zone. Um, this should be a transparent process with audited procedures um, and it's very much a desire that we communicate early and often to the community um, in both directions. Um, we have anticipated issues with signing the route. First of those is that there is a significant portion of DNS resolvers out there which are using eDNS0 and set the do bit by default. Um, which means that they're advertising their desire to receive large signed responses. So when we sign the route, we will start sending those to those clients. Some of those clients are going to be behind things in the network which cause them to be unable to receive those large responses. So when the route is signed, things might break for them. Another issue is that as, we, as soon as we sign the route, we expect people are going to want to start trying to validate it. Um, while we're going through the deployment phase, we would rather that didn't happen. If we have problems and we have to unsign the route for whatever reason, we don't want a community of validators to have formed for whom this is going to cause things to break. 
Um, so to this end, we're doing a staged deployment. Um, the goal is that we never get into a situation where we have a client population that are going to break if we have to unsign the route. Um, further, uh, we want to deploy not on a flag day. We want to roll out the signed route to individual route servers one at a time um, over a period of several weeks and months so that we can gauge the impact of deploying it as we go along. Um, so what we're doing is deploying something called the deliberately unvalidatable root zone. Um, this looks like the signed root zone, but it can't be used for validation. So this will prevent a community of validators forming uh, while we roll this out. Um, what it means in practice is that the root zone is signed exactly as it will be, um, but the keys used to sign it before publication are removed from the zone and replaced with uh, deliberately and obviously broken keys. Um, they look like this. Um, it's a plain text explanation in there that this is not for use for validation. Um, so we hope that nobody is going to ignore that and try to do it anyway. Um, at the end of this deployment process, when we actually go into full production, the zone will change so that the real keys are included in the zone, and this will go away. We're now into this deployment. Um, the L and A servers have already completed their transi transition to serve this deliberately unvalidatable root zone. Um, L route went in January, A route in February. So far, there have been no significant problems with this. Um, next week, M and I will make this transition, and then we're increasing in uh, larger sized groups until there's only J left. Um, after J makes the transition, there will be a period of almost two months before we uh, change to the real signed root zone. Um, as we're going along, uh, measurement is a, is a requirement. Um, we are doing ongoing capture at all root servers um, of uh, priming queries. And around specific transition events, uh, we're doing full packet captures. Um, the DNS work is, uh, is where the data is being sent for uh, aggregation and analysis. Some testing has gone on. Um, the DERS itself is a new technology that we've introduced to the route. Um, so prior to doing that, we did testing of the behavior of resolvers with this deliberately broken uh, zone. Um, that found no problems. Um, on the, the IANA side of this, um, TLD operators who have signed their TLD and have DS records to introduce into the root zone, um, we expect to be able to accept those using procedures very similar to those that exist today for modifying the root zone. And we hope to be able to accept those DS records um, at least one to two months before um, we go into production with the real signed root zone. This is still being worked out, but we hope to have this um, something publishable on this uh, quite soon. Um, on the communication side of the project, uh, we have a web page. There are status updates there, documents and presentation archive. Um, there are links there to some of the tools that you probably have mentioned already um, that you can use to uh, test the behavior of your own resolvers and network with the signed group. Um, and there's contact information there, um, which we encourage you to use if you have any feedback. Um, we're trying to reach out to both non-technical and technical audiences. Um, obviously, technical audiences, we're doing that in forums such as this. Um, this is the draft timeline. Um, it's less of a draft now that we're actually into the deployment. Um, the route has been signed since December, um, just not fully published yet. What you see is, is the deliberately unvalidatable version. Um, we're now in the deployment phase of that, which will end on the 5th of May when JRoot transitions to the DERS. And the project will complete entirely on the 1st of July when we transition from the DERS to the fully signed root zone. Um, the status as of today, uh, we have these documents published. 
Uh, we have these documents published um, on the, on the root, root DNS sec.org website. Um, coming soon, uh, documentation of the ceremony process and uh, key signing key facilities requirements and testing. Um, I think I've already covered this, the testing that's been done. Um, oh, in addition to the DARS resolver testing, there's also ongoing testing between ICANN and VeriSign of the procedures surrounding exchanging, um, bringing zone signing keys to be signed. Um, I covered this already. Um, in addition to the root zone, but independently of it, we're also working towards signing the ARPA and Adar ARPA family of zones. Um, work on getting this done is actually happening, and we're now expecting reasonable progress to be made. We don't have full agreement of how it's all going to work, so I haven't got, I can't speculate as to dates, um, but, but work is, the progress is being made on these. Um, I mentioned before the root signing website. We're very keen to get feedback um, on all aspects of this. Um, you can send email to rootsign at ican.org, and that goes to the root DNS sec design team. Um, that's uh, been my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning. My name's Keith Mitchell. Um, I'm wearing two hats for the purposes of this presentation um, as um, Director of Engineering at ISC and President of DNS Work. I'm going to be saying a little bit about the specific plans that FROOT has for doing DNSSEC deployment. Obviously, there are other root operators out there who have their own plans. I'm sure they'll be very similar to ours, but um, this is our, our corner of the universe. For those of you who are not familiar with ISC, we're a nonprofit. We do various types of internet engineering, specifically open source software, Bind, which is specific to this, um, DHCP, and, and then the after, the, the Suzanne is our new project that just presented about. And we also operate DNS infrastructure and other public benefit infrastructure as well, and the FROOT name server is the uh, most relevant of these to today's talk. As I'm sure many of you are aware, DNSSEC has been around for many years. Um, I'm fortunately to have only been recently involved in DNSSEC and skipped most of the pain. Um, there's been a lot of hard work done. Uh, the quick summary is it allows cryptographic verification that the DNS records that you've received are actually what was sent by the owner of that zone. And there seems to be building consensus that the time for DNSSEC has come. The standards and implementations are now mature. There's increasing abuse of the DNS um, for things like cache poisoning, uh, Kaminsky uh, la last year, for example. And many of the TLDs are now signed or, or in the process of signing. Org, Gov, a whole bunch of CCTLDs are either signed or in the process of doing that. But DNSSEC is based on a hierarchy of trust anchors. The apex, these are the root. You don't really have full validation unless you can go from all the way from the leaf domain that you're validating follow the trust anchor chain back up to the root. So signing the root has been something that's been necessary for full deployment. Obviously, there's been a lot of layer nine around that, uh, but the good news is that ICANN has finally been in a position to agree to have this happen this year. So as Dave explained, ICANN and VeriSign, with help and oversight from the US Department of Commerce, have come up with a root signing plan. Uh, the website has the plan. There are 13 root servers, 12 operators. We'll all be implementing that plan. ISC is involved in that both because we operate FROOT and because um, a significant number of root operators also use BIND to serve the root as well. 
we have more Anycast nodes for effort than any of the other operators. So one of the issues that we face compared to the other operators is some one of scale. There, there are over 50 of these now. We're, we're, we're still adding one or two every few months. Uh, here's the map. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we have a stable version of Bind that, that can support all this stuff. The latest stable version of Bind um, is 9.6.2. Uh, that's just in the process of release engineering now. I'm pretty confident that we should have it out in the next few days, whether in the, uh, the end of the month. A little bit more about bind versions in a minute. There's a three-hour window, so we've got to do 50 machines in three hours, which will be um, interesting, uh, but um, should be entirely doable. Um, and that is the, 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 the three-hour window that's published on the, the, the DNSSEC website, um, and that will be happening on the 14th of April. Um, during our transition and during all the other transitions of all the other operators to the DRZ, um, we're doing monitoring and data gathering and submitting that to ORC. Um, as Dave said, the, the, the DRZ, DURZ provides opportunity for testing. Uh, there are probably whole bits of network infrastructure out there which are not transparent to large MTU UDP packets or um, EDNS zero U queries. One of the things that ORC's done, work, work some work that Dwayne did for us, uh, is a testing tool. If you go on that testing tool, you can use that or you can point your end users at using that to give you an idea of whether the infrastructure between you and the um, signed routes is actually signed. And what I would say is if there are issues, now it's best to do them ASAP because they could get a whole lot worse when the actual route, uh, real route zone is signed on the 1st of July. So data gathering. Uh, F and everyone except Bill will be um, gathering data and submitting this to, to, to ORC. Um, ORC is operating infrastructure, and I'm pleased to say that ICANN has funded some additional server capacity for us that allows us to do various types of data gathering. Uh, Dwayne has already been analyzing some of that data, so I'll let Dwayne say more about the types of data gathering and the types of analysis that have been done. But it's not just about capturing snapshots during the transitions. It's also about looking at the long-term trends as the various servers cut across. Um, somehow I've managed to pick, okay. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about bind versions. Um, as I said, we wanted to be able to say, here's the particular bind version that we will support for this. Um, doesn't mean you, others won't work, but it's a case of if there are any issues, then we want to be able to say, this is the one that we will fix first. Bind 9.6.2. Um, one important difference in this and previous versions of Bind is that it supports the SHA-2 DNS site algorithm, which is being used to sign the root, not because um, the root servers themselves need to be able to do validation using that algorithm, but, but rather um, they just need to serve it. But like I said, we wanted to be able to have a, a line in the sand. Other root operators who are using Bind, we would strongly encourage them to start testing this version and basically um, let us know if there are any particular issues. Um, I said 9.6.2 is the latest stable version of Bind. Of course, we've just released our latest, latest version of Bind, 9.7.0. Um, we call this our DNSSEC for humans. Um, so although all the people who have been buried in DNSSEC for a decade or so have got all kinds of tweaky stuff to make a signed route work, most of you network operators out there have probably found DNSSEC incredibly painful, and particularly end users as well. What we've done with 970 is we've basically put a whole lot of things in there to make it easier, particularly when you're doing validated. That's how when you're doing authoritative servers. Uh, so if you're thinking about signing your own zones, we would strongly recommend that you have a look at by 970. Um, there has been an issue which has been found in all versions of validating resolvers, bind and other ones out there, which causes some issues at the authoritative end if it is run under particular misconfiguration on the um, validating resolver end. Suzanne will be saying a little bit more about that. So for validating resolvers, we would recommend hanging on a couple of weeks because there's um, a patch coming out which will, will address that issue. One other thing that I wanted to mention is um, ISC's DLV. We basically set up the DNSSEC look-aside validation service as a stopgap until the route was signed. 
Um, if it goes away, um, people don't need DLV anymore, that's great. But DLV isn't just about substituting for the root zone. It is about connecting the islands of um, trust anchors together that are not where, the, where there isn't a, a fully delegated chain. We're going to keep doing DLV um, until people stop needing it. Um, but just to let you know that it's, it's still there. And um, we'll be happy to, uh, to help people um, with that. So, in summary... Um, there are full plans and documents available at the website that Dave already re referenced. Um, we'll be working with other route operators to transition F route um, during the week of the 12th of April, actually on the 14th in our case. Um, there's some blog postings on your blog site uh, with information about this. Um, 962 is available in the next few days uh, to support the route operator specifically in this. Uh, signed route will go live on the 1st of July. And um, if you haven't stuck your toes into the DNS site waters, then we'd strongly recommend having a look at line 970. Thank you. Okay, so um, again, my name is Dwayne, and I work for VeriSign. I have a bunch of um, pictures to show you from, from the data analysis. I'm a little bit nervous that uh, the colors are not going to represent very well, so if, if, if you're interested, you may want to download the, uh, the PDF from, from the website and, and look on your, on your laptops in case uh, this is hard to, hard to see. So all, all, this, all this data comes from uh, the DERS, the, the de Deliberately Unvalidatable Root Zone. Um, this has already been explained. Uh, the schedule has already been presented um, by, by Dave as well. So the, the data I have is from L and, and A. And uh, obviously going forward, we'll have, we'll have much more data to analyze in the future. There are two sets of data that we have. The first is um, priming queries only, which we have been con collecting continuously since about December. And um, so that's nice because it's kind of a low, low volume stream that we, can, that we can manage. And then right around the time that each set of root servers flips over, we do a, like a full packet capture for 48 hours. Um, these, for, for these, we capture the queries only to keep them to sort of a manageable size. Okay, so first, L root. Um, just FYI, down here I included the, um, the maintenance window times uh, for, for reference. So this first graph shows the, um, the rate of priming queries coming to L root. And the, um, the maintenance window started at 1800 on this day. And, um, so this, this graph shows about a four-hour window before and after, or two hours before and after, four hours total. And uh, so no, no change here, which, which was sort of nice to see. For comparison, um, now this, this graph overlays all the other root servers' uh, priming query rates. The red one at the top is, is A roots, and that one always tends to get more uh, higher rate of queries than the others. Um, E root has these funny hourly spikes, which I'm not really sure what those are. It could be somebody monitoring something. Um, and there's a, there's a couple down at the bottom, which um, I, I don't think that represents their actual query, rate, query rates. I think there's some missing data here that um, makes them sort of down at the bottom. This graph shows the average reply size for priming responses. And you can clearly see when, the, when, the, when this server first started uh, serving RR SIGs, the, uh, the average size starts going up. 
So it, it, before it was something like, well, I think it's 643 bytes. And after all of their nodes have been uh, switched over, the, the mean size ends up being something like 700, uh, 770 or so. And then here's, here's the, um, the data for all the other root servers at the same, the same time frame. This is um, kind of related data. This, this is a histogram showing the, um, the categories of the response, response sizes. So the red uh, blocks here are responses that are 512 bytes or less. And these are almost certainly from clients that are not sending eDNS0 in their queries. The blue is um, clients with eDNS0 prior to signing. Uh, their responses are 643 bytes, and then afterwards it jumps up to 801. Um, this this graph may be a little bit interesting uh, later when I get to a root to to compare the differences between between L and A. Uh, now this graph comes not from the priming query data set, but from the full packet data set, and uh, this shows the full 48 48 hours and uh, the obvious change in TCP queries right around the, the signing time. So it went from almost nothing to about 25 per second, which is, I think, pretty close to um, what we and others had been predicting would happen. You guys weren't surprised, were you, Dave? No. <laughs> and for comparison, here's the other, the other, um, the roots data. So it's interesting. Uh, again, I don't have an explanation for this, but um, even though L root happened to be almost zero uh, prior to, to switching over, some of the other roots were not. Um, notably, A and L are up there. I mean, E and A and E are up there, sort of high. This is the overall rate of UDP queries coming in to L root. Um, so it, show, it shows some diurnal patterns, but uh, you know, otherwise no significant changes or anything to be alarmed about. And then for comparison, here's the others. So it is interesting to note there's, there's quite a uh, spread in, in uh, UDP query rates between, between all the routes. This, this picture shows um, responses by uh, four categories, the response code and whether or not the, the DO bit was set. So for example, at the top, um, do I have a pointer? Yeah. So this yellow is an X domain responses where uh, the DO bit was set. Blue is... Um, referrals with DO, and then down here is uh, the same NX domains and referrals without, without DNSSEC requested. So again, no, no significant changes in, um, in this data after, after signing happened. <clears throat> this shows the rate of um, queries for, for certain DNSSEC query types. So the yellow at the top is queries for DS records. Not necessarily, you know, any particular DS records, just, just that the query type was DS. And uh, the red shows DNS key queries. And the, uh, the y-axis here is scaled log logarithmically in order to sort of show both on the same, on the same picture. Otherwise, they would be, the red would be dwarfed by the scale. Okay, this, this graph um, I, like, I like quite a bit, but it may require a little bit of explanation. Here uh, there are 11 different colors and 11 different categories of, of clients grouped by their average rate of queries. So for example, at the top is a red line representing uh, the number of clients sending one query per second on average. And then 
the next line is uh, for two queries per second on average and, 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 and on down, increasing by powers of two until at the bottom it's clients that send a thousand or more queries per second. And then the, uh, the log scaled axis shows, you know, how many clients are in that, in that category. Um, so it, when we were thinking about potential problems, you know, we were worried that there would be some clients that uh, stopped getting responses and they would get kind of panicky. And if, if, if that were the case, we would expect, I think, to see some, some increases down here in the, uh, in the lower range after signing. Uh, we would expect to see some clients increasing their query rates in order to get an answer. However, in, in fact, you know, they probably switched to a different root server and, and, and got their answer there. So um, it's, it's a little bit early to be, you know, drawing too many conclusions from this picture. Okay, so now I get to do the same graphs all over again for, for a root. Um, this is the, uh, the priming query rate for uh, when the day that a root switched over. The maintenance window officially opened at uh, 1700 UTC, but we didn't see the first uh, signed response until 1806. So um, yeah, there was some delay in, in, in getting that started, I guess. Um, and then shortly after that, there's this little there's this little uh, dip, um, which I don't I don't really know exactly what caused that, um, you know, but it seemed to recover. It probably this probably lasted about five minutes. Maybe some little routing glitch or, or something caused uh, a decrease in traffic there. Uh, here's the same with uh, overlaying with, with the other uh, root traces. This one shows the the average reply size for a root, um, whereas for for l root the the size went up, sort of uh, it angled up until it got above 750. Uh, for a root, uh, it didn't go up that much more. Um, the increase was not as dramatic. And here you can see, um, again, L root is is way up there at the top, the the purple line. So this is this is the histogram for for a root, and you can see that there's a really significant set of clients um, sending priming queries to a, which lack eDNS apparently, and, and so they fall into that 512 category. And obviously those didn't change upon signing. So, um, you know, it does seem that, that ARUT is in some way special by being listed first. It, it receives more of these kinds of queries from, from clients on the internet. So uh, I'm kind of glad that it got signed earlier in the deployment rather than later so that, um, you know, we can, we can watch this and, and uh, convince ourselves that even though it's special, nothing too terrible is going to happen. This is the TCP query rate for, for a root. And um, <clears throat> you can see the, the, uh, the big spike there when, when signing happened, uh, when, when the DERS happened. But another interesting thing is, uh, if you remember uh, two weeks prior when, when L root was signed, A's TCP rate was 10 per second. And, um, See if I can go back. Now at the start of its deployment, it's it's jumped up to like uh, 40 per second. So we don't we don't have any data in between these two times um, to analyze, unfortunately. So um, I'm not sure if you know I'm not sure if A's rate went up because L root switched over first, or if there's some other uh, something else going on there. This is the, uh, the overall UDP query rate for a root. And the only thing that looks a little bit strange is, is over here on the right side, there's this uh, spike. But um, as these other graphs show, this is really just due to a single uh, client that went a little bit crazy. And you can see that it, it happened on all of the root server in instances, not just A. Uh, they all got hit with this load. Um, This graph looks very similar to the one for L. This is the, the query types, the DNS set query types. Um, here's the, the uh, client query rate graph. And again, down here at the, uh, at the right at the bottom, you can see this 
little uh, this little block right here that represents this one client that that all of a sudden got panicky and started hitting all the root servers with uh, a thousand queries per second or more. <clears throat> and then, kind of just for fun, this this last graph shows the same data for all of the root ser all of the root servers during that period, and and you can see they all have this. Um, you know, if you look at the purple line at the bottom, you can see they all have the same pattern. There's this one kind of U-shaped graph, this one spike at the end. So I want to put out a big thank you to uh, the root server operators who have been sending data to OARC so that we can uh, do this analysis and so that we can, you know, archive it for uh, posterity. I want to thank ISC for helping on numerous occasions being remote hands for me and for... Um, other OARC projects um, at their facilities. And um, if, you, if you have questions, you can contact me or you can go to this uh, URL or you can ask questions uh, at the end of this, at, at the end of Suzanne's presentation. Thank you very much. Hello again. I didn't really plan when uh, I got to Austin to spend the morning up here, but uh, I guess we're uh, stuck with each other at this point. Um, I sort of instigated the idea of this panel, uh, so I guess that's part of why it, it fell to me to sort of try to put together kind of an overview and abstract out a little bit of what we've been talking about here. Um, even though, you know, I wanted to make sure we got to do that, even though in some ways I'm the worst possible person to do it because I've been working on DNSSEC since 2002 and been trying to encourage the root signing activity for uh, almost as long. Um, so arguably I lack perspective, but, but here's what I got. Um, this material has been interesting to the DNS geeks. I'm, I'm as happy with, with data porn as anybody, and this is an interesting engineering exercise, you know, bolting something like this onto existing running infrastructure. But um, that's not all of why I thought it belonged here. So what does it mean? We've seen that DNSSEC represents a significant change in, in how DNS is done in the public Internet. We know how assigned root is being done and what that means for the provisioning of the root. What does it mean for the, for the wider world and for other DNS operators was something I wanted to make sure also got discussed a little bit here. So we talked a little bit already about possible side effects. This one has been around for a while. Dave touched on it briefly. Um, responses from root servers for DOT will include signatures will get larger, greater than the UDP limit. Under certain conditions, this results in a fallback to TCP. We've seen graphs that show the magnitude of that effect for the root servers, but not so much from the, the, the resolver side. Um, EDNS zero was also mentioned, and the takeaway here, EDNS zero is now widely implemented in DNS software, but that doesn't mean it's understood by all the other devices in your network that need to understand DNS. There's published data, um, firewalls, customer premises equipment is not always going to do the right thing with this. Results could be as, as Dave mentioned, some dropped responses, fallback to TCP, other things you may not be used to seeing in your network. You know, widely implemented free DNS zero is 60 to 70 percent. Dwayne, do you have a sense for queries arriving at the roots for what the percentage is? That are... Yeah, I think about 65. 65, yeah. That's, that's... So what this shows us, given that the technology has been around for a while, is that yes, it does get deployed eventually, but the tail is very long. In addition, there's an, the, the, the other takeaway here is that this is an interaction effect. This is not a DNS problem. This is not a DNS issue per se, and whether or not it turns into a problem does not depend directly and only on what DNS software or service you're providing. Um, there's been a testing tool provided by OARC um, and again, we'll say if you see issues, it's better to address them now because 
there is the network the behavior of the network around your d n a service is going to change and you may see some interesting performance impacts when you turn on d n a sec validation later including the point that much modern d n a software as david as dave said and it bears repeating indicates an acceptance of d n a sec data not that it's a validator not that it will do the right thing with d n a sec data but says yeah it's okay to send it to me by default another possible side effect that um, hasn't been as widely discussed um This, what happens if a previously valid key stops working? This, happen, this can happen when key rollover is done. The validating resolver isn't updated with new keys, either automatically or manually. It turns out that under this particular set of circumstances, a lot of fielded DNS software, um, bind, unbound, others widely found in the ecosystem, can be very aggressive in recovery. This is because a bad key looks like a validation failure caused by a man in the middle. One of the things about DNSSEC is that failures tend to look like attacks. And we're still early in the learning curve of, of, of how to distinguish between things that DNSSEC was designed to, to flag for you, attacks and malicious compromises, and the fact that things break and people screw up and mistakes get made and misconfigurations happen. So we're still early in the curve of developing heuristics that can sort of tell the difference and make the right thing happen. The obvious recovery strategy from a key that apparently is bad is brute force. Ask the authoritative servers for the zone for validation data. Because any one server could have been compromised, attacked, or otherwise made unavailable to you by malicious activity. With a significant size chain of trust and a significant base of authoritative servers, such as many TLD operators deploy for resilience, this can be a lot of packets. It's kind of a low probability scenario. A set of things has to happen, but mistakes happen. The other thing that has been a concern on the, the TLD and root servers, you know, provisioning side, the internet has lots of DNS resolvers. Only a small percentage of them can have to be broken for the result to be a lot of traffic. TLDs and root servers drastically over provision. But the scalability is still kind of nice. Future software is going to be less aggressive about this. Um, for example, you know, various vendors are working on their, their own um, take on this. But for instance, Bind will be, ISC will be making a patch available for 9.7, for Bind 9.7 and for other supported versions of Bind in a few weeks um, that will, uh, be a lot less aggressive in this particular scenario. We're, we're still adjusting the heuristics and uh, trying to balance between being aggressive about responding to attacks and being scalable as far as what the network infrastructure really expects or needs. So you know, th those are just a couple of examples. We will be discovering more things as, as we go forward with this. How do we get here? It, the, the takeaway, I think, is that DNSSEC does, in fact, help with certain bad things. I think wide deployment of DNSSEC does mean that we're going to end up with fewer bad things happening in certain ways. We're going to have a more robust and more resilient DNS. But you can't change a system as complex as the global Internet without side effects. It just can't be done. We all know that. So the side effects to DNSSEC deployment need to be managed. You know, we can't pretend they're not going to happen, and we can't pretend that, that they mean that there's no, no cost. But there's, we just need to balance costs and benefits. So I think the, the, the bottom line, it's important to note, many networks, DNS is not a focus. It's not that hard to provide basic service. Configurations tend not to change. It tends to just work. DNSSEC changes this a little bit. Um, legacy devices and assumptions may need to change because the infrastructure you're interoperating with has changed. So, for instance, the kind of interaction effect you have between EDNS0 unaware firewalls and DNS software that may be perfectly compliant and doing exactly what you think it should may, in a lot of shops, is going to end up meeting the, the, the firewall people have to talk to the DNS people, which uh, 
will probably be a novelty for uh, some people we know and love. Um, there, there, there's a, a set of interactions that's going to have to be managed. And if you're in a shop where DNS just works, it's going to be better if there are people there that understand what it's really doing, understand how it may have to change or how the, how the world is going to change around it. So know your network and pay attention to DNS for a change. It feels unloved. Thanks. Okay, how much time do we have for questions? Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. All right. So I need twelve people to come up and ask a question that can be answered in one minute each. Anyone? Anyone? So, Duane, I actually have a question for you. If you can go back to your data. Um, Can you go back where you were looking at the response sizes after the DERS was deployed? It seemed like the response size for L was much larger uh, than that coming back from A. And that so it's a remote question from Lisa Hageman at Dining. Okay. I assume it's referring to this data. Right, so that one versus the prime inquiry size from A. Right. So this graph shows the average reply size. Um, and, and you're right, there is, there is a noticeable difference. And the difference seems to be because L root, for whatever reason, is a very small set of queries without eDNS. This, this red down here is... is much smaller than it is for for A. So hmm. um, now I don't I don't know why. Yeah. So that, <laughs> I, I, is I there a specific reason that you can think of why A would receive a higher well, density of queries? That naively I would I would say that um, there are resolver implementations out there that are not very sophisticated. They pick the first one in the list and they don't support eDNS. Okay, that makes sense. But, you know, I don't, I don't have any other data to back that up at this point. And I don't know where those are. I don't know if they're on cable modems or if they're in phones or I don't know. Yeah. Um, I would speculate also that because LRoot, I think LRoot is the most recently renumbered root server, um, we're not in the root hints on a lot of the older deployed resolvers, um, yeah. and that's possibly why we see less. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, and I do have this, I did generate this, I think I did generate these for other, um, the other nodes, so we, I could look at it, I just didn't include those in, in the slide set, so I, we can answer that that way too. Kevin? Kevin Overman from ESNet. Uh, I must admit I'm vaguely curious about that interesting glitch downward in traffic on the A server after it's cut over and the query size bounce up. They look like they occurred simultaneously. And when I see interesting anomalies in the data like that, I, I'm always wondering, is there some something bigger going on here that I'm just not realizing? Do they actually occur simultaneously? The, the jump up in size that goes away and the drop down inquiries per second that goes away? Are those, those can you confirm whether those are at the same time or not? Um, looking at them visually, yeah, that seems to be the case. Yeah. Um, so, so something was going on there with some software someplace out there doing queries that seems to have damped itself out after about 10 minutes or so. Uh, very strange, probably not significant, but it bothers me. <laughs> Right, and, and I think, um, so another, another thing that people have pointed out is it's, um, it's probably related, well, it should have been in this, it should have been in this hour bucket, but, but this little hump here is a little strange too where it kind of bumps up and then, and then kind of comes back down. Um, I agree, it's interesting, I, I, don't, I don't know the explanation. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna be scratching my head over that for a while because <laughs> 
the, the fact that the number of queries drops and the size of the queries goes up simultaneously when they're in a reverse direction like that makes me think that some software someplace is basically doing a, uh, a lot of internal wheel spinning and not issuing queries for a while. Uh, I know that a large number of root queries are basically garbage queries from a variety of stuff, and I suspect that these probably fall in that category. But right. this is all idle speculation based on way too little data, so I, I think I'll shut up at this point. But another, another point I want to make is that um, we see things like this sort of all the time at the, at the, at the root, roots looking at this data. Um, it only takes uh, a few sort of misbehaving clients to cause anomalies like this. You know, um, this is counting uh, per query. So if you have one client that sort of goes nuts and starts hitting you with all, you know, EDNS zero queries or not EDNS zero queries, it, it can cause a little a little blip like this. And and you see that in the data we have even before, you know, we were doing DERS stuff. So, but yeah, the the, the timing here is is uh, you know very suspicious. <laughs> To, to that point, did you did you look at a distribution of the number of you know uh, requests, their source addresses for those requests, to, in that delta, um, to see if there it, it does have that concentration that you probably does. And real quick, who are you? Where are you from? Oh, Daryl Newcomb, Transit Rail. So it's um, whoops. In this picture, you can see some some spikes right here, and, and it, it's it's the same it's the same thing. Um, so at, at this time, it looks. I'm sorry about the this, this scale here on the x-axis, but you know it looks like there was an increase in, uh, in in most of these categories in the number of clients um, with this behavior. So the number of clients in the first category sending one per second increased during that time, and then went back down. And and the same for, you know, all the way down to about here. This this line was not really affected, it looks like. But, yeah, there, there is an increase in clients. Query. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. No, okay. More questions? no other questions. Let's right. thank the panel. I think it was a very good panel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it.